Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Nina, and today we have Rohan Dixon to, pre to present Engineering Calm Sensor-Driven Meditation Technology as part of the Talks at Google series brought to you by GPAWS, a community of mindfulness practices for well-being change at Google. The last 10 years have seen the growing acceptance of mindfulness meditation in mainstream science. Hundreds of studies have now demonstrated quantifiable physiological effects of meditation on heart rhythms, stress, immune response, and more. In fact, it appears the brain itself changes both during the act of meditation as well as after repeated practice. We'll show you the brainwave, heartbeat, and breath sensors that can help you track your mind during your day. For example, breathing patterns are correlated with stress, and in fact, many forms of meditation encourage watching of the breath. A wearable respiration sensor that gives you feedback when you're stressed can be imagined as a technology-assisted meditation practice. The coming ubiquity of wearable sensors make opportunities for calm engineering like this potentially quite common. We'll show you the state of the field today. Rohan Dixit is a founder at BrainBot and a former neuroimaging researcher at the Harvard, MIT, MGH, Martino Center, and Stanford University. In a search for the ultimate meaning of life, the universe, and everything, Rohan quit his job and bought a one-way ticket to the Himalayas where he lived with Tibetan monks for a year and recorded their brainwaves during meditation. This eventually led to a meditation app that uses a brainwave sensor as well as a flower that blooms with your calm brainwaves. This summer and fall, Rohan will be creating a variety of large art installations that, re that react to your relaxed heartbeat, including a garden of 15 feet tall metal lotuses and huge murals that encourage heart sinking between people. I'm thrilled to present to you today my former classmate and dear friend of 10 years, Rohan. As Nina was saying, my name is Rohan, and I'm the founder of BrainBot, which is uh, a group of three or four friends who are all interested in the intersection between meditation and sensors. So it's kind of an interesting space. You can imagine that sensors are something that's pretty new, especially wearable sensors, whereas meditation is something that's pretty ancient and pretty old. So it's an interesting kind of intersection to be be playing with, and I want to talk a little bit about the companies that are in the space now, the sensors that are already out there, and a little bit about what we're working on now. I'll try to keep it short so that we have a lot of time for questions. So like Nina was saying, my background is actually in neuroimaging, and I started kind of studying the C word. So the C word in, in neuroscience is consciousness, actually. And it's, uh, it's been hard for many years, actually decades, to study consciousness. It's kind of a taboo subject, right? Um, so the way that we do that in, in the clinical context and, and in neuroscience in general was to study things that are very, very concrete, alterations in consciousness, like, for example, people in a coma. You can imagine that somebody in a coma has some degree of consciousness, right? You can poke them or have some kind of basic reflexes still intact, but their consciousness, their sort of awareness, on some level is gone, right? So that's kind of an ins it's a window, an insight into what consciousness is. So, uh, so we studied people who were in comas. We studied people who were under deep anesthesia, which is a similar kind of situation. You have people who, were in, uh, who had epilepsy, temporal lobe epilepsy, and they tend to have altered states of consciousness during their seizures. So those are three kind of short examples of ways of studying consciousness that exists already in the neuroscience world. But eventually, I ended up in Sarah Lazar's lab at Harvard studying people who meditate and their brain. And so you can see here on the screen, this is, a, this is a monk who has a whole bunch of sensors on his head. Those are called EEG sensors, or electroencephalography sensors. And basically, what they're doing is measuring the electrical activity of the brain in real time um, while the monk does things. So um, you can imagine asking the monk to meditate and recording the brain waves before and after and seeing what changes actually happen. And it turns out that the brain actually does change during meditation, both over the short term and kind of the long term. So with these sensors, you're able to kind of pick up on these changes that are happening structurally and also um, the changes that are happening in real time. So why is it that you might want to study meditation? Meditation is kind of a hokey thing, right? It's kind of a woo-woo or magical in a way. But um, the practices themselves um, are actually quite simple. 
and really kind of boil down to attentional training and uh, self-inquiry in a way. So uh, meditation often is associated with the East, but I think this is kind of an ancient trend. The idea of self-knowledge and self-inquiry was something that Socrates was really into, right? Know thyself. And I think that's the basis for a lot of forms of therapy as well today. Kind of having self-awareness, I think, is how all of us right, kind of grow as people. The ability to introspect into yourself, to see yourself in different situations, and to understand how you react to stressors in the world actually allows you to grow. And meditation actually, in part, is that. It's building the ability to kind of look inwards, to see your own body, to see your own mind, and to watch yourself with attention, sustained attention, over the course of your life. So it turns out that just like any other practice, for example, learning juggling, um, you know, if you look at people who learn juggling over the course of three, eight weeks, you kind of see that there are areas in the brain, like in the motor cortex, that actually thicken. That's just called neuroplasticity. It just seems to be the case that the brain actually responds and grows in response to repeated activities. The same thing is true with meditation. And so what we were doing in the lab was basically studying that, trying to characterize how the brain is actually changing. We found a lot of interesting things. For example, it appears that in as little as eight weeks, you can have measurable changes uh, in the brain in areas that are associated with sense of self and also empathy. Those are two kind of things that, uh, two aspects of personality that oftentimes are interesting to kind of play with and to develop. So that was my life as a, as a researcher in a lab. And I love it. I love research. And I'm kind of a nerd about it. But I found myself, as we were studying meditation, realizing that it was actually a pretty beneficial thing. Um, you know, it seemed like the monks and the long-term meditators we studied tended to be happier people, just more relaxed. And I kind of wanted that for myself, although I didn't really feel it. So I decided eventually to follow those monks that we were studying in the lab back to the Himalayas, where they lived, to try to understand what meditation actually was and to do it for myself. And uh, because I am a nerd, I took a bunch of brainwave equipment with me to try to measure their brains. I thought, I could make a device that would help me learn to meditate without any of the kind of uh, the interface of words, right? When you try to explain how to do something to somebody, you can only use words to really describe what you mean. But the advantage of using sensors is that you can actually map um, what's happening in someone's body to what's happening in your body without the crotch of language. So that was the idea. I took a bunch of brainwave sensors with me. And I spent, as Nina was saying, almost a year traveling around through India um, going to these monasteries that are at the top of the Himalayan mountains and meeting these monks. These monks are really interesting people. I can probably tell you stories for days about them. Um, but what, what kind of came out of that was, one, a, a deeper sense for myself personally of just what meditation was and what it could do to you. Um, these people are really, really nice and really friendly. And I think some of that stems in part from their, their practices. And two, it kind of led to, uh, to this app. So when we came back, we... Uh, when I came back from India, uh, some friends and I were kind of looking at the data, and we realized that uh, with a little bit of machine learning, you could kind of pick out when somebody was meditating and when they weren't. So we sort of applied the, the state of the art in neuroscience with a little bit of machine learning to basically interface with a commercially available headset. This thing is like about 100 bucks. It's called the NeuroSky. And help people learn to meditate with a virtual meditation instructor. So this app is in the is in the Apple App Store. I felt a little bit embarrassed not having an Android app coming to Google, but um, soon, hopefully. Uh, and it kind of does some interesting things. So one of them is just habit design, which is really boring and simple, but actually really important. I don't know if any of you have tried to meditate. I, I've tried and failed so many times. It's, it's out of control. And part of that is just the ability to build a habit, right, and to do it repeatedly. So some of what the app does is just simple kind of like this flower, this plant grows in real time. And uh, your goal is to kind of keep it alive, like a Tamagotchi. I don't know if you guys are old enough or young enough to remember what that is. But um, basically, it's like a, a little device that you keep in your, in your pocket. And it was like a little creature. You had to feed it and make sure it was healthy and happy. And so this is kind of the same idea. This is a plant you keep alive with your meditation. One of the cool things that, um, that we were able to build in with, with the brainwave sensor was this kind of real-time feedback, the virtual meditation instructor I was talking about. So in real time, we're kind of looking at your brain waves and we're analyzing them. And when the, when the app kind of detects that your mind starts to wander, it actually can give you a, a short feedback cue. So this is a fun kind of example of how that might happen. 
notice what's happening. Relax and gently reconnect with your breath. So what you can see there is essentially real-time neurofeedback guiding somebody through a meditation. You can do that through sensors. And it's just one example of what you can kind of do. Now, this is another project that, that we're working on. You can actually pre-order this now. It's called the Lotus. It's kind of very similar uh, to, the, to the app in that it, it's a plant, it's a flower that grows, but this is a physical thing. Uh, some friends and I just kind of hacked it together for fun. But basically the idea is it acts as a, as a meditation Pomodoro timer. I don't know if you guys have ever played with this, but essentially a Pomodoro timer is kind of just an egg timer. You set it for, say, 30 minutes or 20 minutes. You start to work at your desk, and when the timer goes off, you know it's time to take a break or do something else, right? So this is a very similar idea, but it's actually a, a flower, and it's integrated with biosensors. So the way that it works is, as you start to meditate, the flower picks up the meditation through the headset via Bluetooth and blooms. Um, so here's a little animation of how that, how that happens. You see the headset. It's sending data to your phone, and your phone is then analyzing and determining when you're meditating and using that as a signal to bloom this physical flower that sits on your desk. Over time, that flower starts to close again, and that just acts as a reminder to, to meditate. So that's another kind of fun project you can do. It's very simple now with, with these sensors and with a little bit of signal processing. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the sensors that are out there. We're talking about engineering calm and sensor-driven <coughs> meditation technology, right? So I wanted to introduce you to some of the, I think, cutting-edge and best-in-class sensors that are out there today. So the sensor is called the Spire. You can pre-order it, I believe, now. Um, and they should start shipping in the fall. But the Spire is basically a respiration sensor. So essentially what it does is it uh, kind of clips into your, into your belt or into your bra. And there's a little flex sensor kind of built inside. And as you breathe, the Spire recognizes that you're breathing and kind of analyzes that on your phone and gives you a feedback signal when it determines that, you're, that your breathing pattern seems stressed out. So you can imagine that your body is all connected, right? Your brain, your heart, your breath. These things are all intimately linked in some way. And so almost like a hologram, if you look at any piece of your body or any kind of uh, any aspect, any biosignal, you can see reflections of other signals as well. And so by analyzing the breath, uh, the people at Spire have been able to find a way to sort of get at when you're stressed out. And the phone kind of buzzes you when it determines that you're either holding your breath or the, or the breath is sort of Indica indicative of a stressed or frustrated state. We actually hooked this up to, to the Lotus uh, a couple of weeks ago at a consciousness hacking meeting, which is a meetup that happens in San Francisco uh, about every month. Uh, this is the M wave. So we just talked about the breath. The spire kind of looks at respiration. Uh, the M wave is a product that's been around for about 10 years. And I think it's probably the best kind of heart rate or heart derived uh, meditation device out there. So I just want to kind of talk you through how it works. You can kind of see, based on the screen, there's like a little box right, and a clip. That clip essentially goes onto your earlobe. And what it's doing is measuring your HRV. So your HRV is, is heart rate variability. It's a signal that's embedded inside of your heart rhythm. It's kind of an interesting thing. And you can probably kind of test this as you sit here. Uh, when you're relaxed, relatively relaxed, and you breathe in, your heartbeat actually goes up. People often have this idea that your heartbeat is pretty stable. It's actually not true. Your heartbeat is constantly kind of going up and down. And the way that it works is on inhale, your heartbeat rises a little bit. You kind of test, right? And on exhale, your heartbeat kind of drops. And so if you graph that over time, what you're seeing is basically on an inhale, your heartbeat goes up. And you exhale, it goes down. And that kind of sinusoidal rhythm is what the M wave uses um, to give you feedback as to when you relax. If you're not very relaxed or you're kind of frustrated or tense, you're not actually able to elicit that sinusoidal wave when you breathe in and breathe out. The way that the M wave does that is with a series of LEDs that are on the side of this device. Basically, as you breathe in, the LEDs go up. As you breathe in, they go down. And you just kind of look at that and try to relax, elicit that wave, um, which of course is correlated with, the, with your body actually feeling less tense, less stressed, and yeah, more relaxed. So we kind of riffed on that idea, the idea of heart rate variability or this kind of stress signal inside of the heartbeat in this big installation we're doing over the summer. So this is happening at Burning Man. We got a grant from them to do a big uh, art installation. As Nina was saying, there are kind of these 15-foot tall lotuses. And this is a mock-up and a rendering. 
Uh, we're building it now out at American Steel. If anybody wants to help, you're more than welcome to swing by. Um, but basically, the way that this installation works is by measuring people's HRV or heart rate variability, that kind of breathing in and breathing out signal of, of relaxation, and kind of correlating that to the brightness of a, of a 15 foot tall lotus in the middle of the desert. Now, it's not just one, like with the M wave, it's a single device, right? But the way that this works is more of an interactive, collaborative thing. Um, so, why would you want to have the HRV measured, the kind of heart rate variability measured for different people? Uh, in a group setting. It turns out there was some research in 2013 that came out of UC Davis. It was really interesting. So I read this and I got, of course, very excited because I'm a nerd and I get excited about this kind of stuff. And what it, what it kind of showed was that people who are in a long-term relationship um, for a year or more, uh, if you put them across from their partner and just kind of have them stare into their partner's eyes, uh, no talking aloud for three minutes, right? It's kind of a long time. Um, it's, it's kind of crazy, but if you're measuring their their heart rate, they actually start to sync up. The heart rate variability of both of these people starts to align and sync. And if you switch that out to somebody in the waiting room who is you know, a member of another couple, so two strangers, that syncing doesn't happen. So the interpretation that the researchers had was that the ability to empathize with someone allows you to somehow have these subconscious cues that actually let you sync with, with other people. And so this art installation is kind of an experiment in empathy. <laughs> Basically, the idea is, mm, the, the state of empathy seems to allow you to sync, right? So what happens if we measure that syncing process, give you visual feedback, almost mechanically, right? And draw your body into that state of, of syncing. Do you then kind of have that reverse mapping take place where you then feel empathetic towards other people? It turns out that your body and your mind are very linked, right? So if you force yourself into a certain physiological state, oftentimes the mental state is connected. And so that's the idea of, of the installation. We're kind of riffing on that as well in India over the, over the fall. So basically, this is a, another big installation, a mural, that we're going to do in Dharamsala, which is where the Dalai Lama lives in India, and also in Bombay, which is a huge city, right? bustling metropolis. And the idea here is also very similar. Uh, you can see on the screen it says, there is a path from your heart to mine, which is a Rumi quote. I'm working on this installation with a really talented artist named Shiloh uh, Shiv Suleiman, who's actually Indian. And, uh, and the idea is basically to allow people to sync in a public space. It's kind of all based around the idea of um, sacred spaces in India, which are often very public. And we're kind of bringing that back with a little bit of technology. So the idea is you touch uh, an illuminated hand that's kind of set against the wall. And there's actually a sensor embedded in one of the fingertips. And that sensor measures your heart rate and your heart rate variability. So as you start to relax and breathe deeply, the entire wall comes alive with LEDs and lights. And there's a message that says, find another partner, and another hand that becomes illuminated uh, across from you. So then you have to find somebody walking down the street. They have to put their hand against the wall. They have to breathe deeply. And when both of you do that together, and the sinking sort of happens, then a hidden message comes out. For example, there's a path from your heart to mine. It's a fun little project, but it shows you, it's kind of indicative of the ability to very quickly kind of use sensors and a little bit of signal processing to make a make an interactive experience that allows people to engender, hopefully, empathy. So we've talked about a couple devices and a couple art projects and just general ideas around meditation and, and sensors, right? Um, and this is something that I think about a lot. The idea is, at least in my own mind, to find some sort of device that I can wear that allows me all the time, right, in real time, almost ambiently, to be aware of my own stress levels and to respond to that um, appropriately. So what you need there is then a sensor, right? And you need feedback of some type. So uh, that feedback could be, um, it could be visual, like the heart math, right? That device with the LEDs that go up and down, you kind of have to look at the thing. You see it's measuring your heart rate and your heart rate variability, and you watch as the LEDs go up and down. And that's visual feedback, right? But there are all kinds of feedback that you could use. You can imagine auditory feedback. We played with that as well. We kind of uh, mock together a little sensor that goes behind your ear and kind of beeps at you all the time. <laughs> When, uh, when it recognizes your heartbeat. Um, but that's also not very ambient, and it's not very wearable, right? The ideal device that kind of does this, the ideal meditation technology is probably totally invisible. It's socially acceptable, um, and, and it's wearable throughout the day. And so with those as design kind of parameters, we have wrestled a lot with how to actually make this thing work. Um, and this is, this is something that we just started working on like a week ago, and I wanted to show you guys and get a little feedback. 
it's a little weird, but um, basically we, we had these sensors, right? And we were like, OK, where on the body can we measure this signal? So what we're measuring now is HRV. It's a very easy to, to pick up signal, much, much more so than these brainwave sensors. And so we were kind of figure out, we were trying to figure out exactly how to, how to measure it. We looked at the wrist. That turned out to be difficult for different reasons. It's hard to get a, a clean signal from the wrist, as any of you who bought a basis watch probably know. It's actually not a trivial thing to do. I think Google Wear, and there's a whole bunch of other sensors that are on the wrist. Not easy. Um, we tried basically all parts of the body. Um, it was pretty ridiculous seeing us uh, kind of paste these sensors all over the place. But this is the process of trying to, trying to find something right in a space where you don't know what the answer is beforehand. And then eventually, I apologize. This is my friend Luke. He likes to take his shirt off. Um, God bless him. But uh, this was actually a photo we took yesterday. And so we kind of, as I said, just came up with this. This is essentially a belt that, um, or a strap that you wear underneath your clothing. It's totally invisible. And you can kind of see um, up on the top right, that's a diagram from a patent <laughs> application that, we, that we're submitting. And uh, you can kind of see it on his chest, right? There's a whole bunch of different vibrating sensors across a strap that kind of looks like this. And so what happens is, as your HRV starts to kind of Relax. And again, just to reiterate one more time what HRV is, because it's a little bit of a, it's kind of a hard concept to grok. So um, what you're seeing in this, in this illustration is basically uh, a time series in the lower right of heart rate over time. Now you can see it's kind of going up and down a little bit. That was me walking down the street. And then you can see me start to breathe deeply and relax. And you can see the, kind of the rhythm start to get really, really sinusoidal and larger. So that large sinusoidal rhythm, that's HRV. That's you being relaxed. And if you don't see that, then you're probably not feeling super, uh, super calm. So essentially what we did was map that to an array of vibrating sensors. Similar to the way that you look at the heart math and kind of see the LEDs go up and down. Basically, the central sensor in the middle kind of buzzes when you're at the, the valley of this HRV rhythm. And as you inhale and your HRV increases, the uh, vibrating array comes alive, and kind of the, the feedback extends across the entire band. And as you stop you with your breath and start to exhale, it comes back down. So what you get is what we call this hummingbird pattern, where basically as you inhale and you relax, you feel on your chest sort of this opening and closing of vibration. It's totally ambient. It's totally hidden. And uh, nobody knows you're, you're wearing it right. But what it does allow you to do is kind of, is kind of be a little more relaxed throughout the day. This is the, the kind of, uh, the kind of uh, design process that, we, that we've been going through to, to find a device that allows you to basically have meditation wearable wherever you go. And so just, I just wanted to show you very quickly. I think some of you may have seen this already. But I just want to show you a little bit of like what this wave looks like and hopefully a little demonstration to close it out. So, I'm a little bit nervous, right? I'm giving a talk in front of a lot of people. I tried to prepare for it. Maybe I didn't do enough preparation. Maybe this isn't going as well as I hoped. All kinds of, you have all kinds of thoughts, right? All kinds of fears. No matter what you're doing, you always have doubts, right? So you can kind of see that reflected in the heart rate. That's pretty fast. That's a pretty high heart rate, right? And you can kind of see that it's, I mean, if you just kind of look at it, every one of those spikes is a heartbeat, right? I'm wearing, uh, I'm wearing some sensors under my clothes, which, of course, you can't see because it's invisible. But this is my heart in real time. So what I'm going to try to do, um, if you guys will bear with me, is try to elicit a little bit of HRV by relaxing in front of you on stage. Uh, so, so what will that look like, right? Um, what you should see is that there will be a period of heartbeats which will start to be kind of condensed faster, right? That's my inhale. Because as you breathe in, everyone's body, just yours, mine, everyone's, your heart rate starts to increase. And as you exhale, your heartbeat starts to decrease. So on my exhale, you should see those spikes start to get a little bit further apart, right? OK, so let's do this.
So I don't know if that was too subtle to see or if I couldn't relax, but that's like a, a pretty good example of how you can use this thing in real time, right? In your real life, because there are always situations, often scattered throughout the day, where you have to talk to your boss or you have to talk to your girlfriend. Or, so there, there are situations where perhaps your, your stress level may be higher than, than normal. It happens in every human relationship, right? And so to have the ability to recognize when your body is getting stressed out and to actually gain control of that it's actually a really important skill because it allows you to then face the relationships in your life and, the, and your world in general with more calmness and a little bit more empathy. So that's kind of the idea behind all of these sensors. And that's the goal of this vibrating uh, strap and the spire and heart math and all these devices that are in this space of engineering calm and sensor-driven meditation. So I kind of want to let this run in the background and, and just take some questions from you guys uh, if anybody has any. I was wondering, uh, like, how far do you think we can go, and what do you think is, like, what do you what do you think is is the direction which is, it might that might appear to be available in terms of, like, providing feedback to people that's becomes basically something they're not aware of. I mean, something that is just so physical that it actually gets totally, like, built into the whole uh, biofeedback loop. Yeah. Um... So you use the word biofeedback, and that's actually what this is. It's biofeedback. Uh, so for anybody who's not familiar, biofeedback is basically when you start to feed back to yourself one of your own body signals, you tend to gain control over it. So that's kind of a weird thing to say, but in the 70s, this is when this research kind of started, they used uh, biofeedback um, on college students who would come into the research lab. So basically what they did was put a little temperature sensor on their finger and tell these college kids, like 19, 20-year-olds, to raise the temperature of their finger, which is impossible, right? How can you do that? Um, but it turns out that if you are actually monitoring that signal and you're seeing it in real time or feeling it across your chest, right, you actually gain the ability over time to move that signal yourself. This is like the this is the kind of the crux of biofeedback and why this is actually um, potentially such a powerful a powerful space. So eventually, what you're able to do is gain conscious control over something that was totally unconscious before. So in the case of the fingertip, it's the ability to raise your finger temperature. Not that useful, kind of a cool party trick maybe if you have a thermometer around. <laughs> but in the case of a signal that's correlated with your, with your stress, with your inner state, if you gain control over that, then you gain the ability to move throughout your day and throughout your world in a way that is much more calm and much more open to what's happening around you without getting stressed out. And so my hope is with all these devices to actually have the, after you wear it for a little while, you kind of gain this ability to control the process and then hopefully like training wheels, you just drop them. The idea is that you should be able to gain biofeedback control over this by kind of feedbacking, uh, if that is a word, these sensors into your own body through your sensory stream. And then drop it. You won't need it anymore. That's, that's the hope. I'm curious your opinion. What are the various advantages and disadvantages of monitoring the heart compared to the brain? Yeah. Um, like I said, I started with neuroscience. And we actually started with an EEG device. Uh, which is which is really cool, um, and we do have a product out there that, that does EEG based feedback. But the problem with EEG is that you can't wear it all the time. Really, the signal itself is very very weak. Um, it's uh, it's very difficult to detect, and then any kind of movement, like an eye blink, for example, just washes out the signal totally. So realistically, in the next couple of years, you're not going to have a device you can wear on your head that gives you this kind of feedback into your, own, into your own mind that allows you to do neurofeedback or biofeedback through the, through the head. Also, it's kind of weird. I don't know if people have kind of like run into this with the Google Glass to a degree, but there's some social stigma, right? That, whether that's justified or not is irrelevant, but at least from my perspective. But there is a little bit of hesitation around wearing something on your head, and it's very visible, especially if it's kind of like um, helping you deal with anxiety or stress or, or that sort of thing. And so, we shifted to the heart because the rhythm itself is much easier to detect. It's been studied for like 60 years. HRV is easy to pick up, relatively. Coming from an EEG background, this is just awesome. And, um, and you can measure it from under your, under your clothes. And so I think eventually, hopefully, these devices kind of actually become part of our clothing. And, and I think that's where it's, where it's going. But at least in the short term, we fo we're focusing on the heart signal because it's easier to measure. You can measure it from places that are unobtrusive. And, um, it's just much more well understood. You know a bit about, uh, I'm actually interested not just in meditation, but I'm interested in trying to figure out 
how to uh, be able to manipulate focus. Uh, so obviously, as a as a software engineer, that's really important in what sure. I do, right? Uh, and there are times during the day when I find it very difficult to focus, and I'm trying to get an answer of, uh, you know, can I measure when I sh either, you know, I shouldn't focus now, I should go to the gym, come back, uh, or whether I can actually get myself into a mind frame of focus where I can get things done quickly and efficiently and correctly. Um, and I think meditation is a part of this, but one of the things I have difficult distinguishing is the I'm just, I'm not, my heart isn't moving that much because I'm just exhausted, right? And my brain isn't actually moving either, right? And so that's sort of a, a state of, of meditation, maybe even focus, but not moving forward in terms of computing, right? Uh, and what I'd like to do as well is come up with something, a, a practice that helps me in my work in addition to just being calm. Uh, and I'm curious whether or not you see any distinction between that and meditation, whether there's a, some other signals that might be worth looking for in terms of building something to help focus. That's very interesting. Um, yeah, so meditation is a pretty big catch-all word. It includes practices that let you relax, but also practices that build your attention. And, and focus is another word for attention, perhaps. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, EEG is really the way to go, I think, for building focus in general. This is more sort of relaxation in general and allowing yourself to um, not be anxious. Uh, yeah. So in terms of building your own kind of ability to focus, I mean, this is probably pretty common advice, but people tend to have patterns throughout the day. For example, right after lunch is oftentimes not a great time to try to focus. Um, the human mind itself you probably have, have encountered this if you take a break from programming for a while or, or from any skill. You kind of lose the ability to sustain it over a long period of time. And you build that back up. It's just a skill like any other. So one way that might be nice um, in terms of finding out your own rhythms is just to track a little bit. I don't know if you already do this, but uh, even a simple um, spreadsheet kind of help. I actually have that thing with that app on my phone to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But I was interested in perhaps connecting that with sensor data so that I can track basically take that sensor data from my own personal self, be able to track patterns in that, and also connect it with constant feedback back to myself of you know, every hour or so, how are you feeling? Yeah. Um, and maybe train it that way. But yeah, you could totally use um, one of these EEG devices. Like for example, our app, uh, Sunlight Meditation, uh, you know, it's kind of a session-based thing. You sit down, you train your focus for a certain amount of time, and then you take the thing off. But it does give you a ton of graphs afterwards in terms of what your attention level was over the period, that period of time. It tracks that over days and weeks. Um, so you can actually start to see some trends in that way. And all that data is fully open, so you can export it um, and slice and dice it however you see fit. That might be one thing to do. I have a question uh, about whether you have any uh, done any research for using this kind of device for people who have depression or memory loss. Uh, is that meditation would help, like help them to get in better? Thank yes, you. it's a good question. Um, so meditation does actually provide, at least in, in studies that have kind of been taken out, that have been undertaken thus far, some resilience to both anxiety and depression. Um, the mechanism for that is not totally understood, but it seems to be the case. So. If you're able to kind of control your attention, you kind of decide to a degree what you think about. And most people that suffer from depression suffer from this ruminative loop. This is what it's described like in the literature. Basically, that's like a very obscure and obtuse way of describing just negative thoughts that kind of run through your head, right? Negative self-talk. Everybody has that to a degree. But oftentimes, people that are depressed can't turn it off. And to a degree, that's a selective attention problem. So if you can train your attention to focus on whatever it is you like, then you can probably move your attention away from those, from those thoughts and um, towards things that are more uh, positive and beneficial to you. So meditation, if you think of it in terms of attentional training, it just builds your attentional muscle, right? So I think that is how it does actually offer some, some benefits with depression. You also mentioned memory, memory loss. Um, me memory is like a several interacting subsystems in the brain. So there's and I'm not an expert, so I, I probably am not the person to talk to you about it. But um, 
I think it is the case that attentional training can improve your short-term memory. So um, yeah, not to uh, tout meditation as a panacea, but I think it does actually help to a degree with, uh, with memory loss and certainly with depression. So have you, uh, do you know that kind of um, research done, like people who selected a group of people, for example, with depression, with this training, compared with people who has not been used this technology to see the difference? Right. I think there are probably a dozen studies that have looked at that now um, in relatively well-controlled ways. So usually what you do is try to compare people who learn mindfulness usually through this course. So most hospitals now, there are like maybe 450 hospitals at this point around the country that offer meditation as training for people with anxiety and depression, also chronic pain. Um, and the way that they do that is through this course called MBSR, or Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction. It's about an eight-week course, and it kind of guides you through, through learning meditation. And I think that has been shown to be quite efficacious with depression. So if you like, I can I get your email and send you some of those studies if that's helpful. Hi, my name is Alex, and uh, I missed the consciousness um, hacking in San Francisco, so I'm so excited to, to come today. Um, so I've been following, I've been reading your stuff since then, and um, I was really interested in that because you studied with monks. I was wondering what your thoughts were uh, that is, is this almost a result of a contemporary society that there's so much external stimuli that we need a device or that we need some kind of hardware now, some kind of biofeedback, uh, whereas for the past 5,000 years, monks were able to do it just through training the brain. Like it's, I guess just something, I, I wasn't quite able to like form the question like how I wanted, but could you speak to, to that? Sure. Um, and that's something I think about a lot. The amount of sensory input we have on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of distraction is out of control. Like, it's probably never been seen in human history before, right? I mean, checking your email, Twitter, Facebook, there is just constant distraction. And to a degree, that's being facilitated by technology. So it's a little bit ironic to use that same technology kind of approach to get you out of that loop. Perhaps, um, perhaps that's the way, to, the way to do it. I think in, in years past, probably people were able to sustain their attention for longer periods of time. Um, and that's probably a factor of having less input and less kind of distraction in general. So I do feel that technology now has a role to play in bringing us back to the ability to, to pay attention, not only to things around us, like in terms of focus, um, but also to pay attention to ourselves. And I think that's where a lot of self-growth happens. That's what I'm really interested in, um, because that's where a lot of my growth personally has happened. So you mentioned uh, biofeedback. Have you given any thought to um, active um, direction of the person using the device. So for example, there's one device out there called, I think it's called Respirator, which uses music. And it, <clears throat> it slows down the music in response to where it thinks you're going, but it like, sort of encourages you to go down. Right. Is, I don't know what class of device that is, but is that something you're interested in? It is. Um, and yeah, we have thought about that a little bit. So what you're doing basically is guiding someone a little, right? So over time, as you're listening to, to the music that's being generated by your, by your breathing, um, if I understand the, that device correctly, you're sort of building an association between the music and your state of mind, at least your breathing pattern, right? So just like anything else, you know, like smells of, of your childhood, say the ability to smell like fresh baked chocolate chip cookies can remind you of mom instantaneously and the whole a whole suite of memories, right? So if there's a certain music that's generated when your breathing is calm, and then you play that music back to somebody, most likely you're able to kind of shift them into that state. So by playing with their current rhythm, like this is my heart rhythm, right? If I'm feeling it vibrating against me, say that that's one of the modes that, we're, that we've uh, built, where kind of like the chest strap constantly vibrates at every heartbeat. It's not super useful, but it is useful in the sense of guiding, which is why I, uh, I built it. Uh, the idea would be my heart rate starting to go up a little bit, maybe too much, and the sensor is reading when my heartbeat is happening and then sort of slowing it down a little bit. So the feedback that I'm used to getting on every heartbeat is delayed a slight amount, and so I feel the vibration as if I had a slightly slower heartbeat than I really do. 
which then guides me towards a state of a slower, a slower heartbeat. So there's a ton of interaction, I think, that, that is possible there through biofeedback. And it's funny that it hasn't really been explored much. But I think that's partially a factor of biofeedback becoming popular in the 70s, um, promising a little too much too soon, and not having the computing power to really bear these things around with you, which is where the true benefit, I think, comes. You may be familiar with these neurofeedback clinics and biofeedback clinics that you know, they're all over the country. You basically go to, a, to an office, sit down for like an hour and a half, once a week or once a month, and you know, pay 100 bucks or 500 bucks or whatever, and try to gain some biofeedback knowledge that way. But I think now that the devices are much smaller and portable, um, a lot of these applications may become pretty commonplace. Um, you said that people in long-term relationships can synchronize their heart rates. I thought that was really interesting, and I was wondering if you know the direction of the causality there. Do people who spend a lot of time together learn to synchronize their hearts, or do people who are unable to synchronize their hearts have relationship trouble and break up before years <laughs> passed? Ian, that's a, fair, that's a fair point, and I don't think anyone knows the answer. Um, but what people did notice in that study in particular, which is I guess all I can speak to, is that in general, when, uh, when they looked at the sort of direction between, uh, between the couple in terms of who was actually syncing to the other, I mean, it, you can imagine that there's sort of like two metronomes happening, right? And what they found was that in general, one member of the couple tended to sort of see or empathize or perceive the other's oscillation and sync to them rather than them both coming to some sort of in-between, you know, 50-50 sort of split. And in general, what they found was that uh, the women in the relationship tended to be able to do that to a much greater degree than the men. So that may have some kind of insight into, into your question. Um, and as a follow-up, are there any other kinds of relationships where this happens? Like, could you use it to predict who would make compatible coworkers or <laughs> astronauts on a mission to Mars or something like that? I think it's possible. And I, the only time I've seen this study before, it's a pretty recent phenomenon that hadn't really been studied much, uh, was with, I believe, family members. Uh, this was a study out of Spain, and people were doing this firewalking exercise where there's a bunch of coals, and one member of the family jumps up and kind of goes, walks across the coals, right? And what they found was that members of their family, even watching them do that, tended to synchronize with the, with the HRV of the person that was doing the firewalk. So it seems to be the case that any close relationship um, kind of elicits that. But I think it's too early to tell. Um, so going back to studying the monks and going into uh, um, meditation, so how, is that, how do you know that that's correlated with brain signals and not um, just relaxing the forehead muscle or something? How do we know that what is not correlated uh, then? The, that going into meditation um, and the uh, signal that you saw off the EEG is not correlated with relaxing a muscle versus what's actually coming out of the brain. Sure. Um, so EEG has been studied for like maybe like 100 years now. And that is a problem that every EEG study runs into. And so there's kind of a whole suite of just standard techniques to get rid of muscle artifact. It looks a lot different than brainwave activity in terms of the frequency response and also the amplitude of the signal. So in general, people build in what are called artifact rejection algorithms, just muscle basically uh, signal rejection that kind of, kind of tries to see if there is, in fact, like forehead muscle activity or eye blinks or whatever and reject that. Um, yeah, so that's one way to do it. Another is to like, I think that's probably, that, that's a, a good enough answer. There's a ton there actually in terms of the algorithms that are used to do that. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I mean, you mentioned EEG sensors and sort of muscle tension blowing away those signals. Um, I'm kind of curious what we can expect from consumer-grade hardware. Like you mentioned, the neuro sky sensor. Um, you know, can we actually get a, an interesting signal from that, or do we have to go with something much more uh, expensive? <laughs> yeah, that is a great question and something we've struggled with a lot. So the neuro sky is like probably the cheapest EEG device that's ever been released. It's a single sensor, and it's pretty noisy. Uh, I mean, coming from a research background where we use higher quality research grade, right, and clinical grade EEG, the signal is almost night and day. To get any kind of usable signal out of, for example, a NeuroSky is an incredible feat of signal processing and machine learning. And, um, and we're helped by the fact that in meditation, usually your eyes are closed and you're pretty still. So 
so basically what we found is a kind of subset of, um, of what you can measure in terms of brain activity and an activity that allows you to do that pretty well and get a relatively good signal. Um, there's a device coming out pretty soon called the Muse, which I think is, is just now fulfilling their pre-orders. And that's a, a much more high quality device. I think it's five sensors or six rather than just one. Um, but I think for at least the foreseeable short-term future, a lot of these consumer-grade EEG devices are going to be much less high quality than your passive electrode kind of uh, clinical EEG. All right, thank you very much.